Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Thanks for watching Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage Vault Series. The Vault Series is a series of interviews that we shot starting back in 2004, two years before the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum opened to the public. If you like what you see, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Thanks for watching. Today's guest, Elvis's first drummer, DJ Fontana. This right. is where we started, actually, Louisiana Hayride. Uh, this is B. There's a guy over here, the announcer, Frank Page, Scotty and them were somewhere all on the side. But this is where we really first got started with Elvis. See his clothes, how funny they were? But that's where we got started. Hadn't been for that hayride, we'd have still been at horn, horn picking cotton, I guess. Mm -hmm. After you lost that kid in the, in the fire, what, do you remember what you had next? No, later on, after I joined Elvis, we was, uh, we was down in Houston, and that's when I found these. And the reason why I got this little set, because they're small, and uh, this belonged to uh, Herb Brockstein. It was his little personal kit, and he was a jazz drummer around Houston for a long, long time. Herb's still there, in fact. To your recollection, that's that really is the first name brand kit that you that you. Yeah, got? that was it. That's and I had those. I had these, and still, like I said, I still got them. And that's all I ever played on. I did the Hound Dog, the Don't Be Cruel, the Jailhouse Rock, uh, all Heartbreak. the big records with them, yeah. Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak, did, did them all. It, it was a pain kind of carrying them around, you know. But uh, these sounded so good on record, and I hated to use other stuff, so I just always carried mine around. Did you meet or did Elvis meet you, or how did that come about? Well, I was at the Hayride, the Louisiana Hayride down in Shreveport, and uh, I was kind of playing what they call staff. They had a staff band there. And I had just joined them a couple weeks before that, you know, because the country artists at that particular time did not like drums. Right. They just absolutely didn't like them. They had their chunk rhythm and their slap bass and all that stuff. So uh, they said, well, you know, you can sit here and if somebody wants you to play, you go out and play. If not, just sit. You know, I said, okay. So Elvis come in, him, Scotty, and Bill. And they had used drummers you know, up around Memphis, different places. So they asked, I said, yeah, I said, let's go back in the dressing room and talk about it. They only had a couple songs as it was. That's All Right and Boom Moon in Kentucky. And, mm -hmm. and they, they were doing other people's songs. That's all he had completely. He, you know, he was doing Sam Cooke and different ones like mm -hmm. that. And I said, yeah, we, well, we could do that. And so I, I figured it out real quick. Those Sun Records were really unique in sound as, as it went. I said, now still use me playing a bunch of cymbals, play tom-toms and all that noise. Play a stick and a brush, stay out of their way, and let them do what they do well. Where was the first studio you recorded in then, you know, with Elvis? Uh, that was on McGavitt Pike. You know, you know where they had the studio? Uh, the, the, uh, Crook and Chase? Yes. There. That was the first one. Oh, really? That was a, it, that's what RCA used. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if it was a real, real studio, but they had equipment there. Right. The only thing they didn't have was an echo chamber, and they wanted to get that same sound as that sun thing, which they never got. Right. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Nobody could get that. Sam knew what he was doing, and uh, he got it. And, and, and I was always shocked. I saw these guys going down the hallway with some mics. I said, well, now where are these guys going? I thought they were leaving. What they were doing is setting up some mics in the hallway to pick up the echo. Right. So that's where the echo chamber was, down the hallway. When was the first time you played, like, in, in what, is RCA B or A or? Oh, that, that wasn't long after they had the, the RCA B. And we worked there a lot at, at the RCA B. And then we went to, if we go to New York, we'd go up and do a television show. We'd always go up there to their studio in New York and do some stuff. And whose studio would that be? It'd be RCA, RCA had, oh, RCA, had okay, a studio okay. in New York. Okay. And uh, we'd stop off there and record, and we'd always, like, when we get through recording after the shows, we'd come down the coast to Richmond, all th and we'd work show dates all the way down to Miami. And uh, they, the Colonel didn't want us off too much, you know. So, right. So we had to keep moving. So you recorded Nashville, New York. Um, Finally, we went to the coast. It was later on we went to the coast, and that's those movie tracks. Movie, the movie tracks, uh huh. And it was real late when we come to Nashville to start recording. And he liked it here because it was close. He could get in his car, fly up here, and 30 minutes or whatever, so he started recording here. And all the guys he knew by then, you know, he knew Bob Moore, Pete Drake, uh, he, he knew all the guys. Uh, he, me and Elvis, you mean? Yeah, Elvis knew everybody. He, mm -hmm. he, 
He studied records. He knew who played on all these records. All the blues guys, he knew them all. You know, not not personally, but he knew who yeah, they them. were. Yeah, mm -hmm. he knew exactly who all of them were. Uh, with our case, I think we stopped. Well, we never got it recognized because the Colonel didn't want us on there. That was the Colonel's thing. You know, he that was, was the main man. The Jordanaires were on there because they almost demanded it. And I was let them be on there. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You know, but we never did push it that hard. You know, we just. If it's there, okay, we'll do it. If not, that doesn't make any difference, you know. But it should have been nice if they'd have put us on those records. Now, who was producing Elvis when you started playing with Elvis? Well, let's put it this way. There was no producers. We had uh, the guy from New York come down, Steve Scholes. And, and I call him, my, it's my own personal opinion, I call them all clock watchers, you know. Oh, Elvis, that's 2.35, that's a real good time. But Elvis had the final word. Whatever he said, well, that's what they did. Did he do a lot of overdubs? No. Now, early on, he hated the overdub. He just hated it. He wanted everybody in a one pile, cut that record as we go. He didn't want any overdubs. What about his vocal overdub? Well, you got to remember, when we first started, it was on mono. Right. So we had, everybody had to just play. There was no overdub, and you, if you, you had to do it again. Mm -hmm. Start from scratch. And he didn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'd go up and say, oh, you know, this little glitch here. And don't worry about it. He said, uh, it's going to pass so fast they're not going to hear it. <laughs> said, you know, if it ain't sold by then, it ain't going to sell anyhow. So mm -hmm. let, let it go. He said, mm -hmm. you guys were playing pretty good. The record felt good. And he was interested in mostly the feel of the record. Right. He said, it felt good and I was singing okay. Leave it alone, guys. Don't touch it. And he wouldn't touch it. You have memories of Chet being there with y'all? Yeah, Chet was around a few days. Not, he didn't stay long. Well, I think most of it was Chet didn't want to stay up all night. Right. You know, we didn't come in until 6 o'clock in the afternoon, and he wouldn't get there maybe until 12, you know. So the guy, we didn't care. We were still on the time card, so that was okay with us. Mm -hmm. And he might, he'd pit around for an hour or so playing gospel and singing and playing piano until he warmed up, and then he started cutting, you know. Mm -hmm. And then he'd get, boom, right at one, one right after another. He had it all figured out. Where did he, where did, how did he find his songs? Who pitched all of his songs? A uh, company out of New York, Hill and Range. A big outfit, and they in turn he had a couple of publishing companies, Gladys and Presley, and they were taking care of the supervision of it, and uh, that's where we got all the songs from. They, you know, all they had a bunch of New York writers, and but Lieber and Stoller and those guys, right. they wrote for a long time. Yeah. Well, uh, so Elvis, he picked his own songs. Oh yeah, he mm -hmm. picked them all. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He hadn't heard a one until he got there. He sat out in the middle of the floor at RCAB. It'd be a stack, you know, way up there. Really? I yeah. mean, y'all didn't hear him until you got in the studio? No. Man. I, I guess he wanted to hear him. I don't know. And he, he listened to, throw it across the room. Now, throw it, uh, no, I don't like that. He only listened to eight or ten bars. If that didn't hit him, right. boom, across the room it went. You have another stack over there. You say, well, yeah, yeah, well, well yeah, we'll, we'll listen to this again. He put it over there. And then the you know, next thing, you know, we had eight or ten songs, enough to do a whole album, whatever you wanted to do. But he, he, he had the final say. You have any special memories of, of Bill? Uh, we were doing a song, uh, I forget the name of it now, but it was a, a kind of a fast tune. And uh, he had a bass line. And he, Bill was just playing electric, just got the electric that day, in fact. And Elvis wanted this, he could hear this and what he wanted in his ear. And, and Bill could not play, he just couldn't get it. Because that's, that's his first day playing electric bass, you know. He finally got mad. He threw the bass down. So you play the darn thing. Elvis says, "Okay, I'll play it." So Elvis played it. It's that uh, "Baby, I Don't Care." And da 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 da. It's from a movie, and he played what he he heard, and it worked out for him. <laughs> Bill said, "Okay, you got it. You play it." So he could play a little bit. Uh, Elvis could just to show you what he wanted. Yeah. And played a little piano, a little organ, a little drums. Just, I, I always call it just enough to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you never knew what he's going to come up with. Do you remember the largest crowd that you guys played for as a, as a group? Yeah, it was probably the old Dallas Cotton Bowl, not the new one, but yeah. the old one. Uh, and I guess we had thirty-five or 40,000 people out there. And that's well, the biggest crowd I've ever seen. Now, what kind of PA did you have to reach that kind of crowd? Whatever we had at the stadium, their, their PA system, which wasn't, none of them were very good. So but was it kind of like the Beatles saying, just all you heard was a bunch of screaming? That's all you hear. We, we couldn't hear nobody. We couldn't hear him. He didn't hear us. We just, us standing on the bandstand, we stayed together, you know, me and Scotty and Bill. And uh, 
far as he knew, we never knew where, where he was at all. Most of the time did y'all travel in cars? Cars, or we had one car. And uh, we finally convinced him he should fly from like Lubbock to Dallas, we just right in Texas. Yeah, that might be. So he flew for about a month or so right there in Texas. And then we was, we was in Texas, one, or somewhere over there, and it was, we was coming here to record. And it was Amarillo, actually, Texas. We got the, we were supposed to land in Little Rock, but we landed in Hot Springs, which we shouldn't have been there. And uh, we took off, the guy said, well, there ain't no fuel here, you have to go to Hot Springs. He said, well, I thought we was in Hot Springs. This is the pilot talking now. He don't even know where he's at. Right. And you think, that ain't scared us. This guy don't know where he's at. We're in trouble. So we, got, we got, almost got up, and the plane quit. It stopped. He started on the wrong fuel tank. That was an empty tank. He had just enough to peel off. Lucky we, we had enough to, you know, when we peeled off. And he reached down and cranked that other. So, and then we, after that, we, we, le we left. We did the session in Nashville. We left here and we went to Memphis. Well, he went into the biggest storm you ever want to see in your life. Like the shook us out of the air. And with the plane, they had a little light one, one single engine plane, you know. So we got, we got to Memphis, that was said, boy, just don't say anything. Just get our stuff out of this plane. We ain't flying with this guy, never again. So the guy was with us, agent. He went inside and got us, a, we had to go to San Antonio. So he said, go get us some tickets to San Antonio. If we can go, fine. If we can't, we're not gonna go. Tickets Luck, on For airplanes. This is, we had to get commercial flights. Yeah. He, he wasn't about to fly with this guy right. anymore. Mm -hmm. He's going to take us all the way to San Antonio or Elvis. No, he ain't take us nowhere after all this trouble. What you know? year was this? I got 55, 56. Okay, so this was before Buddy. Yeah, then he, he then the radio went out from the plane. That's another thing. Then he couldn't get the landing gear down. It wouldn't go down automatically. So he's circling, trying to crank it down. And after all that, Elvis said, that, that's enough for this guy. You know, that's just too much trouble. I figured we're going to catch it sooner or later, you know. <laughs> so, so did y'all do commercial from then, or did you hit the road again? No, no, we mostly road. We didn't hardly ever fly commercial at all. So you never, you never really had a bus or anything. You just went like in Cadillacs or, or, or well, we had one car. Wagons, Every, but, we had yeah. one car. Everybody jumped in one car, mm -hmm. and and the baggage and the instruments on top and on the sides or wherever we can get them, you know. And then he'd always have like one of his cousins with him, Gene Smith, or Billy Smith, the Red West. Some of the guys always with him. When did that start? Put it all the way. The, he, he never the, wanted to be by himself. Certainly there was a time when it was just you four guys, right? Very seldom. When he leave Memphis, he'd have, all, he'd have people with him. And we don't have one car, and, and we was like this, just <laughs> all of us. And of course, he, had, he, he finally made, built a rack for the top of the car, mm -hmm. put the bass and some drums up there and a couple of other instruments and stuff like that. So we got by okay, you know. Was that was that scene in the in that in the TV show they did where the car caught on fire? Was that for real? Yeah, yeah, a couple of them catch on fire actually. Then those then, Cadillacs back then, the, the, the back wheel bearings would get hot, and uh, they would burn those brake lines, and it would spew the brake fluid all over the brake shoes and everything. They would catch them, and they were bad about that. I guess that was the characteristic of the car itself. We had a couple of them burn up. Well, burnt, uh, one of them burnt down to the ground, and one of them, we finally got some sand and stuff that we threw on it and knocked it out for a while, you know. But they, they were bad about that. And we, he had enough sense to get his clothes out. We, we did get his clothes out and our stuff out, you know, it was okay. Man, I, I can't imagine carrying around a big base like that on the top of a car, <laughs> man. We, oh, that, yeah, that was funny. One night was going that, down to Arkansas somewhere, and somehow or another that base flew off. It went, whew, you know, just went off. And it was dark and it went out in the woods somewhere. The base did. And we all jumped out to go look for the base. Pretty soon we hear, doom, 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 doom. What's he doing? Bill's playing his best, see if it worked. It didn't break, it didn't crack, it didn't do anything. That's unbelievable. Ain't that something? And that was the one that Paul McCartney bought. Same base. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's the one that just teared all the pieces, but it didn't. I don't know what happened to it. And maybe it went airborne and just landed in the ground. It went airborne. You, it, it flew over the headlights, you know, and then it went uh, past. It flew in front of you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. It just went, just like an airplane. So y'all hit the brakes and it just took off? Yeah, something happened. We had to stop all of a sudden. That was yeah. a rocking base. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a rock and roll base. Yeah, oh, really? That's just amazing. And then we hear, and we couldn't see Bill. He's out in the woods uh -huh. in the dark. 
uh, above the headlights, and oh, we hear the bass going doom, 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 doom. <laughs> well, hey, he homed in on it then, didn't he? he yeah, he went down and found that bass. Yeah. He loved that bass. Yeah. That's amazing. And how did you carry your drums in the trunk or something? Yeah, we had some of them in the trunk, some of them up on that rack. He, we, that's why I said these small drums, we could get away with a lot of stuff up there. They, were they protected from the weather at all? Well, or? yeah, they had a big, heavy tarp one, uh -huh. big, thick he had made. Uh -huh. Then I had covers for all these. I had the, the I didn't have the, the, the hard covers because there wasn't no room. So I had the little pl plastic, you know, that goes over these things, and it fit just right for all the instruments. So, um, so all we really had was Scotty's guitar and amp, which was right about that big, you know, and then Elvis's amp, uh, guitar, and that's all we really had to carry. So y'all continued to make the music for Elvis all during the '60s, all during the movies. Yeah, and such and, as they were. And then uh, the comeback special. We we did that, and that's the last one we did. That was it. Yeah, we just. Well, he wanted to go to Vegas. He said, "You know, I, I, we're doing this so we could show this to build the thing up to go to Vegas." Mm -hmm. And we said, "No, I don't think we want to go." So well, I didn't go. Scotty didn't go. The Jordan Airs didn't go. So, as I thought about it after he passed away, I said, "Well, maybe we should have went. You know, it'd been fun." 